Welcome back to Podcast Recovery, everyone. We're your hosts, David O. Eric V. And Al A.B. Uh, today we are joined by our very special guest, Daniel. How are you doing today? Hey, everyone. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And uh, where are you from? Where are you from, Daniel? I am calling you guys from Vancouver, Canada. Nice. What, what, what time is it out there? Like 4.15-ish? 4.10-ish? Yeah, it's just after 4. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so a three-hour difference from where we are. We're out near uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah, the sun's shining bright here. Oh, wow. It's cloudy and rainy here. So big, big flip of the script. So uh, when were you first introduced to recovery? Oh boy, I was first introduced to recovery, uh, I, I think it was 2001. Um, mm-hmm. I had had, I'd been using substances for a number of years, uh, but life had been going okay. Uh, there really wasn't, I wasn't really experiencing any serious consequences as a result of my, my substance use. And then it was, it was definitely escalating and I had an mm-hmm. encounter with a roommate that uh, turned a bit violent. Uh, the police got involved and it was one of those those moments you realize uh, there might be a problem here and Mm -hmm. uh, that was when I started talking to my family a little bit about uh, options to perhaps attend recovery or go to treatment or do something like that and and uh, they they recommended a facility to me locally here and I went there I remember just being there for for a week and I asked them why they'd never uh, suggested this to me before and then they, they told me that they had actually told me about it hundreds of times. <laughs> I just nice. guess I had never been in a place to listen. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. And uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, uh, tell us uh, about your clean date. What do you think about that? Yeah, I get that. You know, well, that's a common question. You're in recovery mm-hmm. and people want to know how many days uh, how many days in you are. And I... I kind of have this habit of avoiding the question and I'll tell you why, not because I don't like to really answer it. It's because I experienced a lot of relapse in my uh, years in, in recovery, uh, up and down. It was definitely, definitely a journey as it is, I think for all of us. And, um, I found that there was a real, I really experienced an overemphasis on the number of days, uh, clean, tracking your, your dates, your sober date. And for me, that really uh, perpetuated a cycle of shame. I was always kind of uh, ashamed of my lack of sobriety because I felt like I was constantly restarting. And yeah. I think that uh, in, in, in some circles, maybe unintentionally, uh, we, we put such an emphasis on counting days sober that um, it almost is... Uh, more important metric than the quality of the recovery that a person is living in. And so for that reason, uh, I say I'm in recovery. Uh, the number of days are not important. Uh, I, I am a person of abstinence. Uh, I do live in, in sobriety every day, but I don't want to um, perpetuate uh, guilt or shame in others um, in any way. And I also don't want people to feel that they they need a certain number of days sober before they have something to offer. Um, we all are at different stages of our journey and you can offer encouragement and hope to others, even if you have only one day. So absolutely. I love that. That's fantastic. And, uh, with all that out of the way, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you to share your story and experience with us. So pitter patter, let's get at her. Thanks so much. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share my story and, I got to try and tighten it up here, right? And keep it, uh, keep it to 20 minutes or so. I already alluded to this moment in my life when I, I had this violent, uh, incident with a roommate that ended up with me in the back of a police car, really recognizing that there was a problem developing that, that the substance use that seemed so fun and hadn't really turned into a lot of life altering consequences was clearly, uh, becoming problematic for me. And that was kind of the beginning of the recovery journey. Uh, I spend more of my time talking about the recovery journey than I do talking about what got me there because the, the circumstances that lead people into substance use, they don't, that doesn't confuse or surprise me in any way. Uh, what's more surprising to me is that there's any sober people in this world at all. 
uh, the world, you know, life's got suffering and it, their pain is a part of it. And most of us have experienced trauma in our, in our early lives in some regard. And um, I feel like it, the fact that I found some meaning and purpose in my life is one of the things that sustains me in recovery today. And so I don't need to spend a heck of a lot of time talking about what got me into substances. I did spend almost 15 years addicted to heroin. Uh, it was my, my drug of choice. And it was, I was introduced to it rather innocently enough. I actually didn't even know that's what I was taking. Uh, someone had, had offered me a prescription medication called Dilaudid or Hydromorphone, which is essentially... Uh, pretty prescription grade heroin and uh I, I was innocent enough to not realize that that's what it was i thought it was amazing it was life-changing it was a warm hug it was an opportunity to escape from the life that was so <clears throat> excuse me just uh painful around me mm -hmm. and uh, numb out the that those feelings and so that was thus began a very up and down journey with that drug and others, of course, and, uh, you know, I'm grateful to be alive today outside of uh, the context of the ongoing overdose crisis because fentanyl was not the problem it is in the, uh, in the drug supply when I, when I was using all the time. And yeah. uh, I, I suspect that I may not even be here talking to you guys had I continued using it to the, into the crisis uh, as it exists today with fentanyl mm -hmm. completely contaminating the drug supply. So, uh, I, uh, I was uh, raised in a Christian family and, um, mostly came from a conservative perspective, uh, in life. And as a result, um, I felt a lot of guilt and shame around my substance use because I had this inherent uh, belief structure that using drugs was bad. And uh, that if that's uh, if that's the path you're, you're opting to go down in life, then you know it's you're morally weak. You're making poor decisions. Um, you're not uh, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And I remember hearing my dad share, you know, uh, oh, you've got so much potential. I think many of us have heard that from loved ones or, or parents at, at some point in our lives. Uh, you've got so much potential. And I just felt like um, that, that I think maybe it's supposed to be an encouragement or supposed to be some kind of uh, a statement of uh, motivating you to, towards change. But for me, it was just like this dismal, hopeless uh, thing that made me acutely aware of how I was not living up to my potential. And uh, that's just a devastating thing to, to discover when you're, you're young and your life is not going in the direction you, you think it's going to go in. And uh, I, I'm a person of tremendous hope. Uh, I believe that there's hope for anyone, no matter what stage they're at in their substance use, no matter how many times they've experienced relapse or uh, how stuck they feel. Um, and I feel like that by, by talking about hope, we can really encourage others to have um, hope, even if they don't feel it at the moment. And so that's why I love podcasts. I love listening to people's stories uh, because they, they do offer us hope when, when we're not feeling it for ourselves. And so it's great to be able to, to talk to you guys about that. But um, a little more of my story. One of the biggest barriers to long-term recovery that I feel that I experienced was a, a kind of error in judgment that I made regarding the trauma that I experienced as a, as a young person. And uh, I think we've heard a lot in, in recovery circles about the, the idea of trauma being underneath uh, what drives a lot of addiction for people. Um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an addiction doctor, a popular addiction doctor here in Vancouver named Gabor Maté, who, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he, yep. he has a famous quote that says, don't ask why the addiction, the question is why the pain. So, uh, in essence, getting underneath the outward behavior and trying to dig at what, what is the what is the addiction serving? What purpose is it serving? What are those substances doing for that individual? And, and what pain are they escaping from? And he, he really does emphasize that 
essentially all addiction uh, has trauma uh, at the root of it, underneath it. And, uh, you know, we can debate whether that's not true, whether that's true or not. It's not important. I, I know I had traumatic experiences that contributed to that, uh, related to what I believed about the world, what I felt I was told as a, as a child by, by my loved ones. And, uh, when a lot of that stuff came crashing down, I was left in a, in a place of, uh, just confusion and uncertainty, um, mistrust in, in God or a high power. And, uh, it, it seemed that drugs filled the void really, really effectively. And, uh, Yet one of the errors in judgment that I was making was looking at those traumatic experiences and comparing them to other people that I knew who had traumatic experiences as well, but were not, in my estimation, uh, mine were not as significant as theirs. For instance, I had close friends who had been really harshly sexually abused, I had a friend who had been raped, uh, a friend who had you know, lost their, their parents, and... I was looking at what I had gone through and I felt there was no comparison. These people had a, a justifiable reason in my, in my opinion, to be, to be suffering and to be numbing out and to be wanting to escape from their problems. Their lives had been very difficult. They'd been really, really poorly uh, mistreated. And I looked at my life and said, you know, pull it together. You're, you're, you haven't had it that bad. You haven't, you haven't been treated this way. You haven't been abused like this. And, uh, I felt that in retrospect, coming from the perspective of where I, I see my life today, that was a big mistake because it prevented me from being honest about the pain I was experiencing. It pre prevented me from recognizing that, uh, I was using substances to cover up pain, whether, uh, whether it was as significant as, mm -hmm. as what someone else I knew had experienced or not was really irrelevant. Um, it, whether I was using my adult mind to really analyze my, my experiences as a youth. And it was not, it was trying to rationalize things rather than accept the reality of those painful experiences. Mm. So, yeah. uh, you know, if trauma is there for, for people that are struggling with addiction, then part of the, the healing process would be acknowledging that and accepting it and, and stop comparing ourselves to those around us uh, and the pain that others have experienced. But one of the, the real markers for me in my recovery journey um, was a sense of hopelessness that I felt early, early on when I first heard the kind of catchphrase, once an addict, always an addict. And uh, I, I know that that's, that's uh, <clears throat> I think I understand the spirit behind that saying, uh, because what it means is, it is kind of a, the intention is to protect people from becoming complacent and mm -hmm. fa failing to remember how dark and miserable it was and how bad your life was. And when I was living in my van and, and didn't really have anybody around me. And, uh, you know, if you can remind yourself of where you were, then you're less likely to go back there. And I know mm -hmm. that in the year, the many years of my recovery journey, I experienced a lot of relapses. It was a real up and down. I would have periods of sobriety for, three months or six months or a year. Uh, but then I would, would go be right back in it. And that slogan, that, that kind of motto, once an addict, always an addict stuck with me from an early age. And, and for me, I interpreted it through a lens of hopelessness. Um, I, I didn't process it in the, the way maybe it was meant to be processed as, as keeping you, keeping you focused on, on the goal and keeping you conscious of your, um, your tendency to, or, or propensity to go back to that, uh, drug of choice. I rather thought as a completely hopeless statement, you are, you are now taking on the identity of an addict and you will always carry that identity with you wherever you go. And I, I, I kind of felt that for my own journey, and this is one thing I really like to emphasize people to people is that I recognize every single person struggling with an addiction or not. Every person in this world is, is on a journey and has to find the, the path and the tools 
that work for them to maximize their own personal potential and they need mm-hmm. to set their own, their own goals. And so while there's a lot of modalities out there, I don't say one is better than another or one is worse than another. I'm not in any way intending to criticize um, Narcotics Anonymous or the 12-step model because I know that that slogan is often is attached to them, so that's not what I'm trying to, to do here. I'm saying that the way I as an individual interpreted that was uh, a message of hopelessness, and I, I personally had to reject it in order to find success in my recovery journey. I personally did not want to take on that label. And uh, and so for a long time, um, you know, I had people telling me I was in denial uh, about uh, who I was. Like, come on, you need to come to terms with what you're, go- what you're dealing with and you need to admit you are a drug addict. Like, you can't pretend you're not. Your life is clearly controlled by, by heroin. You're, you're spending every penny you get on it and uh, you're neglecting your family and your responsibilities and, and your work. And, and so uh, there was a little bit of a, there was a long battle with coming to terms with, with okay, yes, I struggle with addiction, but I don't need to live with uh, forever with the addict label on me. And, uh, and that's, something that I figured out, I think a little bit over time on my own. It's something that became a little clearer through uh, a program called smart recovery, self-management and recovery training, which is based on a cognitive behavioral therapy model. uh, And they really uh, discourage people from using labels and some Mm -hmm. people are empowered by taking on a label. Uh, Others, not so much. So I'm really grateful that there's alternatives, uh, that there's pathways that other people can find. One of the things, uh, you know, that I mentioned was that there was a lot of relapse. I really feel like my recovery journey was marked by, by a lot of relapse for a lot of years. And, um, I feel like that cycle would have continued, uh, if I had not found, a way of looking at relapse differently and see what one of the things that I had done was often I would look at relapse as absolute failure. Uh, and part of that's attached to that, that whole system that I mentioned about counting days sober and just the fact that I was really, um, entrenched in wanting to be seen as successful. So there's these these milestones, there's these markers, there's the the one month marker and three months and six months and one year and they're they're significant accomplishments and I don't uh, intend to diminish them for anybody that wants to celebrate those those accomplishments. But I experienced so much relapse that I'd achieve I'd achieve one of these goals and then I'm back at day one and I felt like a failure. I felt the shame and I felt crushed by the guilt and I just felt like I was never going to break that cycle. And one day I was uh, in that place and a friend of mine asked me a brilliant and uh, rather simple question. Why, why did you relapse? And I did not have an answer for him. And it was rather astonishing uh realization to come to it was rather amazing that uh i did just had never really thought about that but i said i don't i don't know i can't answer that question and he he in his wisdom said to me you know if you cannot answer that question you will probably repeat this cycle forever and ever Mm. and that was kind of the day and the moment that i realized uh i needed to look at relapse as a learning experience Mm-hmm. that it was not about resetting to square one to day one, that rather it was an opportunity to find out what is not working for me here. What am I missing? What are my belief structures around my addiction, around substances, around whatever I was going through in life and what, what went wrong, what led up to that? And I actually had a counselor uh, who gave me an assignment that was, I'd never heard of this before. I don't know how common it is, but it it was brilliant for me. And the assignment was um, write out your next relapse. And that sounds uh, sounds a little morbid. (laughs) It sounds a little uh, 
um, maybe counterproductive uh, because my hope had always would always be, well, I don't want to have an X relapse. So if someone would, had said something like that to me, I'd be like, well, no, I'm not going to engage with a, something like that because I don't want to create a self fulfilling prophecy. I don't want, I don't want mm-hmm. to be an X relapse. So why would I write about it? He goes, no, no, no. Just hypothetically, what what series of things would happen in your life? What series of stressors? or difficulties or challenges would lead up to a relapse for you and write it out as if it's happening, you know? And I, I was able for the first time in my life to really uh, become self-aware enough to articulate the, the things in my life that I was running from, the pain, uh, the responsibility that I was trying to avoid, the, the pains that I did not want to feel, the intense feeling of, being a failure, feeling like being someone who was at that point in time uh, in his early 30s and constantly feeling like I was a decade behind most of my peers. And mm-hmm. so feel it, feeling like an utter failure because I'd spent that, you know, so many years uh, essentially wasted um, that this assignment opened my eyes to see how that process of relapse was not something that happened in a moment of weakness. It was not something that happened because I had a bad day or got, or was in a bad mood. It was something that was happening incrementally over time. And, uh, studies actually show that the relapses do tend to be in the works for two to three months before they culminate in actual physical use. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was eye opening and, and really it was life changing. And ever, ever since then, I, I've actually never looked back and never relapsed again. So it was a transformative experience. It, it really got me to a place of becoming self aware in a way that I was actually thinking about my, my life and uh, the things that were going on within it. And it also gave me a sense of um, power over my life. Uh, that I, I could think about things and I didn't have to be controlled by them. Uh, one of the things that I've done, which, uh, again, sounds a little on the dark side, but is, is that I think about worst case scenarios. I think about the difficulty of, uh, if my wife died or if a child of mine got really ill or I, uh, something collapsed with work and I was, I was not having, didn't have an income anymore. And I, I, how would I handle that? How would I respond to that? How would I respond to it in a way that would not involve me going back to use substances to escape that pain? And so I've thought that out. I've kind of played that, that tape out as far as ahead as I can go. And, uh, that way I have contingency plans. I have friends and family, uh, in my life that I can, reach out to and connect with that know my weaknesses and know um, that when they, when I would need them to be there for me. And I, I had this play out in my life uh, last year when my, I have a 11 year old son. He was uh, 10 at the time and he, he uh, had a comp- he had an appendix come out and there was complications related to the surgery. It was incredibly uh tenuous situation with the doctors did not know what was going on. And there was a number of days where he was, um, uh, it was just a complete unknown and we didn't know if he was going to pull through or what the problem was that he was going through. And he was in the hospital for nine days. And, uh, I was, uh, I was stronger than I'd ever been. I, I was the one that held everyone together and was able to, to be a part of the, uh, connected to family and be there for him and be there for my wife. And, and that was, uh, that was such an encouragement to see that compared to say that experience happening to me five years ago or six years ago, I would not have, uh, that would have been a, a perfect opportunity to escape back into old patterns and habits. So yeah. people, ch- people change. Uh, I'm, I'm a, a big advocate for um, really paying close attention to your thinking. Um, the modern mindfulness movement, you know, really, really sitting with your thoughts and paying attention to what's going on 
are those thoughts true? This is one of the kind of foundational ideas of cognitive behavioral therapy. You know, we have these, we have our thoughts. Are they true? Can I, should, can I do a cost benefit analysis on this? Are there irrational beliefs attached to my thinking structure right now that I, I really should dispute and not, um, and not give so much weight to them. And, uh, so now I, uh, I work in uh, advocacy uh, related to drug policy and also related to the overdose crisis, educating our community here on uh, the, the increase in fatal overdoses. We, British Columbia it had its worst month ever for fatal overdoses in May 2020. We experienced 170 fatal overdoses. That's 5.5 people a day in our province of uh, 5 million Ooh. people. So it's a dramatic uh number that's the highest total ever. We've been in a public health emergency here for four years. And so I I found a lot of meaning and purpose in, in the, taking my story to to the community uh, and educating them about substances and the current drug supply and how toxic it is with fentanyl contaminating it and uh, understanding that so that we can we can uh, see lives saved, training people in the lock zone and um, reducing stigma, just uh, changing the way people think about substances and, and the people who use them, uh, not reducing people to uh, one word labels. It's fine if you want to call yourself an addict, but uh, the rest of society doesn't need to throw labels on you. You know, we, yeah. we shouldn't be calling anybody junkies or crackheads. Those are such pejorative, derogatory terms. These are human beings. Uh, who have tremendous potential, like myself. If you know me deep in my addiction, um, you know, I, it was as dark as it was for, for anyone you've met. And uh, yet now, today, um, uh, I have uh, two kids, and I've been married for 14 years, and uh, happy life, I have a small business, and get to share my story like this. So life is good. Awesome. That was a great share, man. Um, Thanks. We yeah. definitely, we, we definitely have some questions for you. Um, oh, good. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I, I'd like to go first, if if, it, if that's okay with Ali and Eric. Go that's ahead, fine Dave. with me. All right, Eric probably knows what question I'm going to ask. It's going to be the fun oh. question. Oh, this is a stupid question. It's not a stupid <laughs> question. It's a fun <laughs> question. Okay. So Please. I ask. Yes. I ask almost all of our uh, non-American uh, speakers on the podcast this question. Oh, so what I is know the, where we're going. <laughs> yeah, what's the weirdest thing you find about Americans? Oh, okay. Actually, that is a fun question. Um, yeah. Just something quirky uh, or, or funny. Well, I got to be careful here. Uh, my wife's family is, half Amer- is American. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, uh, they just live over the border. I'm, we're right close to the border here in Vancouver, and uh, so they're not far away from us, although there's no visits with the uh, coronavirus going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, the weirdest thing. Um, well, I'll t- how about I just tell you a story? Uh, okay. The, the, gu- I li- the gun thing. So I, I had a buddy in the state, yeah. and yeah. He, he said, uh, hey, let's go to the river and do some target shooting. And I'm all for that. I'm I, I, Guns are fun. I'm all, I'm all right with that. So we went down to the river to do some target shooting and uh, pulled out the gun. And no one else, there was other people down there, but no one else had the guns out. They were just chilling at the river. And uh, not even two minutes after we started shooting, the next guy started shooting. And he had a bigger gun. And then another minute later, the guy beside him pulled out his gun, and it was even bigger. <laughs> and before 20 minutes were up, everyone at the river was shooting. <laughs> and I was just like, that is hilarious. This would never happen in Canada. Like, it, it's, I don't know if it was a one-up and ship my guns bigger than yours, but it was, uh, it was quite entertaining. And, uh, you know, I think all, uh, the Second Amendment's a great thing and as far as I'm concerned, and uh, I think that the gun thing is an interesting interesting debate in the States and uh, we, we don't have it quite as intense up here in Canada, but uh, by all means keep discussing guns. That, that, is, a, that is a very uh, American scenario to have happen. Very much. <laughs> all right. All right. 
Allie, what do you got? Um, I just want to say that story, I feel like, represents America so well. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it was really good to hear your story. And um, I can, I don't know, like, it, you know, I, it, I have seen it so many times where people hide behind pain time but really have zero recovery. And uh, it was mm. one of, like, the first things I noticed. Like people be like, I have 22 years clean, and then later they share they haven't worked like a fourth step or something, and I'm like, what? How do? You, what? Anyway, like I, I knew that that wasn't the path that I wanted to take. Um, mm. So you like mentioned somewhere in your story about um, the, all of the different options like of recovery, and there are like so many. Um, so I was mm-hmm. just wondering, like, what is there like a particular? style of recovery that you follow, that you, like, like a 12-step base, like, uh, whatever type of, of base recovery do you work? Because clearly it's working, from what I heard. I'm um, so yeah, you know, about it. Well, I would, uh, so I would plug Smart Recovery, uh, smartrecovery.org. Smart stands for self-management and recovery training. I already kind of mentioned the cognitive behavioral therapy model. And one of their foundational principles or or beliefs around addiction is that it's primarily a learned behavior. And I I know that there's ongoing debate around the disease model of addiction and other competing models that are starting to emerge in academia, Uh, one being the developmental model, uh, which personally I would lean closer towards the developmental model than, than the disease model. I feel the disease model is necessary uh, because it has done a great, great service to, in the medical capacity of treating people with addictions as, as humans, recognizing that this is a medical issue that they need to be, that there's treatment that we need to respond to them with and getting away from the old fashioned moral failure version of, uh, understanding addiction. So I feel like our, collective understanding of addiction as a society over the last hundred years is continuing to evolve and develop. And uh, I hope that we don't get hung up on, you know, this is what addiction precisely is. I mean, I'm inclined to think that um, everyone is addicted to something. Uh, Mm -hmm. And um, so some substances clearly have uh, greater consequences attached to them and greater propensity for ending your life, uh, for sure. Uh, more likely to, to die of an overdose if you're using illegal drugs than you are if you're binging Netflix, clearly. Um, but the quality of life is diminished in the same way. Um, people not, aren't living up to their potential. They're not discovering who they really are. They're not fulfilling their purpose. Uh, they don't have meaning in their lives. And, uh, you know, deaths of despair is a common uh, label attached to overdoses and suicide uh, that's been going on in North America for the last number of years. And uh, I feel it is a crisis of meaning and that if we... Um, If we give people every opportunity to find what their individual path is, then, uh, then we can, we can really start to bring a change to this. Hmm. Well, that that. was beautiful. That was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks. T T to you, Eric. (laughs) Um, so talking about smart recovery, um, I'm curious because I I just went. Time is always going to be very fucked up on this podcast because we record so far in advance. But I went through um, the Smart Recovery Handbook a few months ago, and oh yeah, one oh, of cool. the yeah I think I think it's great. By the way, I'm I uh, I came up through NA, but always I feel like if I were to participate in a fellowship or a group, it would probably be smart. Um, but one of the things that I found interesting is the cost benefit analysis. And could you describe mm, yeah. kind of, you know, what, what that process is and then also, you know, how you utilize that in your recovery? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, cost benefit analysis is not a new idea or it's definitely not unique to smart. Um, it's just some, a tool that they have put forward as saying, Hey, 
if you're spending, if we're going to focus a little more on our thinking here and understanding what we think about our substance use and what we think about our addiction, and uh, then one of the tools we can use is a cost-benefit analysis to, to, to help us make decisions. And the cost-benefit analysis basically says... Um, it's like pros and cons. I mean, you're going to make, you're going to write it down. You're going to write down the scenario that you're dealing with. Uh, I'm going, maybe I'm going to a, a party and there's going to be alcohol present. I feel I'm vulnerable to, to drinking. Uh, what are the benefits of going to this party? What could be the costs? Um, that sort of thing. And you just really are, are breaking things down into bite-sized chunks. I spent very little time thinking critically about my substance use, mostly it was emotional reactions, mostly it was just um, ritualized habits, uh, learned behaviors. So a cost-benefit analysis slows things right down. It gives you an opportunity to, to think about um, your decisions and to really just uh, step aside from yourself. Uh, step mm-hmm. aside from your emotions, step aside from your feelings towards something and start thinking about it a little more logically, a little more analytically, um, a little more objectively in that sense. So, you know, it takes some discipline, of course, to develop that as a habit and actually start implementing it. Um, you know, but once a person does, you can do it on the fly and it, it, it really can be life changing. And mm. and how do you um, you know what's an example of you actively using that in your recovery as of late that technique? Oh yeah, good question. Well, I feel like personally, uh, like one of the ways I'm just wired as an individual is is I'm highly analytical, and uh, it's it's definitely a strength. But like any strength, it's got a shadow side. Uh, so you know it's. Uh, it, I find that the cost benefit analysis actually comes pretty naturally to me. I'm, I'm using it, uh, almost, uh, intuitively all the time in my decision making process between, um, work related stuff and family related things. Uh, I'm always trying to, uh, find the best course of action. Um, I don't late, like I really have not been, uh, I don't experience cravings or find myself in situations where I'm, I'm particularly vulnerable to uh, potentially using substances anymore. That hasn't happened to me for quite a while. So I haven't had a scenario where I've needed to play that out uh, for a bit. But it's one of those things that now it's just kind of intuitive. It's ingrained. I, I want to analyze. Uh, I, I think I use it most often in relationships. <laughs> <laughs> Huh. That's awesome. All right. Um, I want to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask two questions. One, I, I want to go with another fun question because I'm just in a fun mood today. I've had I've had a good day, and I'm just I'm, I'm, good. I'm in a good mood. Now I want to keep it rolling, and this is going to be for all four of us. Just uh, and and I'll answer it first. So wh- whatever you guys think, uh, shout it out. Um. What's, what's like one of the silliest things that you find helps you in your recovery? Because me personally, I was like, I was, and I literally just thought of this question because I was looking outside. And it, anyway, um, Bob, watching Bob Ross videos centers me so much. And like, whenever, whenever I'm going through a tough time, if I just put on some Bob Ross, I just feel so centered and so much better about like what's going on. And I, it, it's such a silly part that I've that in the last couple of years I've actively used in my recovery, and uh, yeah, that's one of my silly tools of recovery. Nice, Bob Ross is great, classic. What about you? Well, I don't know if I have. Uh, man, I, you're making me wish I was a little more uh, lighthearted and silly right now. I, I don't. Maybe I take life a little bit too seriously sometimes. <laughs> uh, I right. would say that one of the greatest uh, tool kind of things for me, and this is is uh, podcasts. Really, uh, it's it's just yeah. kind of a grounding point for me. It's become a it's become a ritual. Oh, I mean, mm-hmm. dare I say it's become a, an addiction, perhaps? I'm Ooh. not sure. But it is something that I, I often work alone. 
and I mm-hmm. load up my podcasts for the day and uh, and it's something that really keeps me me grounded and centered and you know hearing people's stories uh, this is one of the things I hear often at smart is um, when you hear the story of someone who is recent is new perhaps they're mm-hmm. sharing about really being vulnerable or having recently had a lapse or a struggle or, or difficulty maintaining their sobriety those are the stories that keep me uh, keep my recovery like really motivated because yeah. I remember the, the how I remember being that person and how that feels in the moment and the intensity of the emotions and the physical pain and withdrawal that went along with the fact that I was addicted to opioids and I don't want to feel that ever again. So those stories, uh, are, while not silly, are powerfully uh, motivating for me. All right, all right. What about you, Allie? Do you have any silly tools of recovery? Um, I don't know if they're necessarily silly, but like, I think that for me practicing like meditation and, um, you know, like mindfulness and just like being so lighthearted, even in like a really heavy situation, it's kind Mm -hmm. of like, you know, it's one of the things that reminds me nothing is too much, right? Like I can make it through anything. Um, whether it's like, you know, without using or whatever, without being an asshole, without, you know, acting out in the old habits and, um, ways of, you know, acting out. Um, but like one of, I guess like a silly, silly way to like describe that is, uh, so I have these like cards, they're spiritual AF cards and every day yeah. I read one and I post it on my Facebook page because it's like, it makes me laugh. It brings a smile to my face and it makes me like get outside of myself even if it's for like five minutes like I'm not self-consumed for those five minutes and that you know it's it's one of those things that is silly that I do that helps me nice come on Eric don't make me the weird one you know you're the weird one, man. Like, weird you one. know, you know you're the weird one. You know, like what you're expecting? Yeah. You're expecting me to like say something that I I tell me like cuddling in a pile of your three cats makes your recovery better. Just like well, say well, something like that. Of course, cuddling with animals makes me feel better. But like if I'm having a stressful situation, I don't really know if I'm like like my brain is like all right, so I'm something's wrong. I'm going to figure out how to, like, problem solve, like, the situation. I'm not going to, yeah. like... You're very analytical as well. Yeah, it's it's yeah. hard. I mean, if I burn out or I'm stressed out, like, sure, I will... I'll watch some TV. You know what I mean? Like, I'll binge watch okay. something. And we can get into, like, the, you know, shows I watch. But, um, and, you know, my animals mm. will all, you know, come in and snuggle. But, uh, I mean... Yeah, I don't know, man. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah, expecting me to be the savior here for you. I, I don't know if that was a good call on your end. Well, I was I, I was really <laughs> counting on Allie to dig me out of a hole, and I, it was a total swing and a miss on my part. <laughs> well, what's your next question, David? I'm trying to... Hmm? There might be secretly just... something else. Yeah, there might be secretly something else that I do that I can't think of. Um... Maybe, like, sometimes I'll zone out and I'll get on social media and I'll watch, like, tutorials on, like, shit that I'm never going to do. But, like, <laughs> there you go. Like, okay. I don't know. Like, it's, <laughs> there we go. All right. So I'm also right. here, David, just to make you feel better. Yes. All right. All right. Now my real question. Uh, Daniel, uh, how important is owning your own personal recovery journey and really making it fit to what works for you in a, in a personalized uh, recovery uh, scenario, not necessarily um, totally buying into this or that or um, trying to fit yourself to a, a different paradigm and, and really like letting it be about you and your journey. How important is that? Okay. That's a great question. And it's hugely important to me. Um, I, so I am completely abstinent, um, uh-huh. re- reluctantly. It took me a long time to come to terms with that. And a big part of, uh, oh, I think, many of the relapses that I experienced were tied to the fact that I was insisting on trying to figure a way to still drink alcohol uh, responsibly. 
in my life. Mm. And uh, I, so I came to where I'm at through a journey of trial and error, uh, so to speak, yeah. through, through the lens of looking back at the things I attempted for my own recovery journey that worked and the many things that I attempted that did not work. And one of the smart tools actually has individuals uh, develop a hierarchy of values. And one of the things that I value the highest is personal responsibility. It's taking ownership of your own stuff, taking ownership of your mistakes, taking ownership of your life, and not placing the blame on anyone else. And in, in recovery circles, I think far too often, people formulate what their recovery should look like based on what other people tell them it should look like. And mm -hmm. we, we've got, we've really, um, for instance, I mean, I, heroin was my drug of choice. And, uh, for years I resisted the idea of, uh, trying, um, methadone or suboxone, uh, because it didn't line up with my, uh, perceived journey as far as what I thought my recovery should look like. I thought it should be complete abstinence model. And I, I, I didn't really understand methadone. I didn't really, I, I only heard it through the lens of, uh, ideologues basically saying that if you're on methadone, you're not really in recovery or you're not really abstinence or you're not sober. And so I completely re rejected it. Perhaps those medications would have, um, help me actually, they might've been stepping stones to getting me along sooner. I actually did in my, uh, last years, uh, in using, I did try Suboxone for, for a season and it was a real shift in my, um, in, in what I thought recovery would look like for me because I, I had to change my mind on it and people need, need to find that they need to find their own journey. So I couldn't emphasize it more, but I also think that the advocates and the support people, the, the facilitators, counselors, uh, their, their approach should be to find, finding out what that individual wants. Do you, do yeah. you want abstinence? Do you want total sobriety? Do you want to just reduce a little bit? Like what are your goals for life? And then meeting the person where they're at. And I think in most cases, a lot of people might, um, they might just say, I want abstinence because it's the right thing to say, or that's what they feel is the right thing to say. Uh, they don't think it's a realistic goal for them. And so they're mm -hmm. they sabotage themselves from the beginning because they're not being honest about what they, they think they can attain. And maybe they do get there eventually and maybe it's, maybe it really is more of a process. So, um, there, there's just too much emphasis on, uh, you know, you need to achieve all your goals tomorrow, uh, in recovery. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, perhaps we should look at it a little more as, uh, let's make it incremental improvements uh, day over day, week over week, and, and see where that leads us. If you, you improve your life just, uh, you know, a little bit each day, uh, you, you know, where are you going to be in a year or two? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was a great answer. Allie B. Oh, hold on. Guys, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. David, can you repeat the question? I was a little zoned out watching the rain. I'm being honest. I'm going to ask it. It's there you go. where I am. So she's she zoned out beautiful. watching the rain for recovery. Um, I do. No, it's, I do. It's, 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 uh, you're up for uh, asking a question. Oh, for asking a question. Okay. Um, God, I feel like I already know so much about you. Um, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Eric, do you have one? And then we can circle back to me because I don't want to ask them off the wall question because I'm not prepared now. I found out watching it. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I really... So what you were just talking about, um, it was actually something I was talking about with one of our other hosts on Wednesday. I'm reading uh, this book, which I bring up probably a lot. Um, what's it called? It's called um, The Power of Habit. And... I think um, you know what you're talking about where, where you're saying it's a learned behavior more than the disease model um, and not just that but when you're saying that you know the concept of abstinence and one of the, and like maybe this isn't even a question maybe this is just a topic but something I've like been thinking about a lot um, now that I'm reading this book is how 
it is a lot to ask of someone to stop doing everything, right? Like, just yeah. the, you know, I wasn't just addicted to heroin. You know, I was addicted to benzodiazepines and, like, amphetamines and mm. cocaine and, you know, a bunch of other stuff. Like, you also have nicotine, caffeine. You have, like, all these things. And then there's, like, you know, and you can say there's mm-hmm. levels, but to ask someone, because it takes... It takes a moment to change a habit, right? You, like, and that's what we're doing is we're changing habits. Like, there's different cues during our day where it's like, oh, I woke up. Oh, I need to, like, you know, do this drug. Oh, like, I'm getting in the car. I need to light a cigarette. Like, oh, I'm, like, going into the kitchen when I wake up. I need some coffee. Like, there's just these automatic cues. And Are you it, telling my story right now, Eric? Well, and it's kind of... What's yeah. crazy, though, is... Attack. <laughs> that we're expecting people to change overnight, essentially. Like, change their base yeah. habit formation in one day. Um, and it's more than just one habit. So, you know, you're yeah. a relapser. I'm also someone who's relapsed um, quite a few times. Now, how... And you, you mentioned maintenance, right? And and that, you know, it didn't it wasn't something that you, you participated in. But do you believe with your relapses, like if you would have gone about the recovery process as kind of like, all right, let's take care of the heroin first. And then like, you know, you move mm-hmm. on to the next thing, do you think you would have saw yeah. and you know, we're not we don't know, right? But do you think like that's a method that could prove like successful if it's not like you either get clean or die. Yeah. I think, uh, what you're saying makes a lot of sense because, and I don't think it's just crazy. I actually think it's, it can be harmful the way we approach it. Um, I mean, I know of a, a story of a, a young, young man here in the, in the province that he, you know, the way the uh, treatment model is set up in a lot of places, I don't know how it is where you guys are, is that, you know, there's there's plenty of different types of treatment centers. Some allow you to smoke cigarettes, uh, some do not. Some are pretty restrictive on your, you know, what personal belongings you're allowed to have with you. Some are not. Um, and this person uh, ha- had an addiction to substances, but also smoked cigarettes and also uh, really, really, thrived off and needed their their music uh it was mm-hmm. something that ground, grounded them and he uh went into one tree the center that he wasn't allowed to smoke at and so you know just it, it was just too much for him and he could he couldn't make it well ended up withdrawing after a couple of days uh entered another one where they would not allow him to have his, his music with him and uh that was just too much and too overwhelming. Uh, and three days later was uh, dead of a fatal overdose. Mm. And ugh, these stories are heartbreaking and far, far, far too common. I mean, addiction is the one um, health condition where if you go to treatment and you, you know, okay, you're acknowledging I have a, I have an addiction. I'm addicted to this, this drug or that drug. Um, you, uh, you know, you're getting a counselor and the counselor's saying, yeah, it appears that that's true. It looks like that's what's going on with, with your life. We can see that. And then, you know, you sneak out one night and you use, or there's uh, you smoke a cigarette secretly. And, uh, and then the response from the treatment facility is, uh, your behavior has now confirmed our diagnosis. You are struggling with addiction. Now get out. Mm. They, kick you, they kick you out for confirming something that we all know for, for the, the behavior you struggle with, the fact that you have an addiction. And so the, the, the treatment model uh, is loaded with flaws. Um, would it have worked differently for me? I don't know. Um, I, I think I tried a lot of things over the years. I had a, I had a crazy idea once because the withdrawal from heroin was the worst for me. It was, that was the, that was the thing I was trying to avoid at all costs was going into withdrawal. And it took a lot to get me to a place where I would enter into a, a detox or treatment because I knew the pain that was coming. And I had this brilliant idea one time that I would, uh, I would just stop using heroin and then use crystal meth for, for 10 days straight. Cause that mm. would probably get me through the heroin withdrawal. Solid. That, yeah. That was a bad idea. It didn't work out quite as planned. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, 
this is an important thing you raise, meeting people where they're at uh, and saying, hey, like, let's bite, let's get bite-sized chunks. And, I mean, I think this is where outpatient can really meet people where they're at. I think this is where harm reduction plays a role, recognizing that, hey, if you're drinking a 40 a whiskey a day, uh, let's, let's reduce it. Let's, let's cut it down to half. Let's switch to beer. And let's see, see if we can reduce the harm here and, and make incremental steps. Uh, and, and a big part of that would be helping people uh, stabilize their lives outside of just the substance use. Let's look at the whole person. What's your living situation look like? What's going on with your, your work or, or lack thereof? Uh, what's your family and relationships look like? And coming around that person. In Switzerland, they created a, like one of the programs in Switzerland that's available is a, uh, a heroin program for people that are addicted to heroin. They can get on uh, the heroin program and they don't have to hustle or uh, make the money or, or commit crimes to get the money for heroin anymore. The government provides it for them as much as they want. And mm-hmm. individuals that uh, enter into this program, their life stabilizes the craziness around them. Uh, uh, stops, right? I mean, when you're spending 20 hours a day just trying to survive, just trying to avoid going into withdrawal, and then suddenly you have a stable, regular uh, supply of those substances given to you, you don't have, your whole life opens up to you. And yes, you're still mm-hmm. addicted, and you're still using that drug every day, but something has changed in the sense of your ability to stabilize your life. And the results of that program over, over a period of time are astonishing. The vast majority of individuals uh, whose lives stabilized as a result of it tapered off, slowed down, decreased their dose, and many of them completely came off of it, 100%. So, you know, and that's incremental over time without pressure and without saying, hey, you have to be abstinent tomorrow. Like, let's, let's, let's take it progressively. But you need, you need proactive doctors, you need educated counselors, and you need a, a revamp of the treatment system as we have it in order for, for us to be able to uh, meet people like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Amazing. Alex? Did you think of anything okay, or are you still I, watching the rain? I am, no, I had a question. I just was like totally caught off guard because I was not paying very good attention. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned, um, you mentioned raising awareness about fatal overdoses in your community. And mm-hmm. I was just wondering, you know, how you go about doing that. Is it through like, um, like a program? Is it just something that you've created? Um, cause you know, I, I find it hard to kind of communicate that information to people that are using personally. Yeah. So. Thanks for asking. So we um, we have an action table committee in our in our community, and we are funded. So we created a project funded by a government grant. The government made a bunch of money available to uh, communities that were really uh, dramatically affected by the overdose crisis. And we developed a program called We All Play a Role. So our our emphasis is on encouraging the community, uh, and this is not just a uh, this is not even about addiction. We try to uh, steer away from making it about addiction and rather about substance use in general. Uh, we recognize that a, a large percentage of people that use substances don't develop addictions. Uh, many people can, can use um, drugs, even drugs like cocaine or ecstasy, uh, occasionally, just once in a while, and not ever have problematic substance use or, or it affects their lives or relationships or anything. And yet, in the context of uh, the drug supply, what we call a toxic drug supply, basically where uh, fentanyl has contaminated the entirety of it, uh, we want to educate the community to recognize that they play a role in mitigating the overdose crisis, and there's a few ways that they do that. So we, we put on uh, community presentations. Uh, we host them in public. Um, we actually have one we're hosting in a couple weeks on Zoom because we haven't been able to do things uh, in the community for the last little while. Um, we go to businesses and we train their staff. So the, the training involves understanding the overdose crisis, understanding the drug supply. Uh, a big part of our emphasis is on reducing stigma. So recognizing that people with addictions don't look a certain way. It's not really just about homelessness. I mean, the media does such a terrible job of representing people with addictions. They generally show back alleys and needles on the ground and, uh, 
And it just doesn't look that way for, for the vast majority. Yes, it, it affects some people that way. Some people become homeless. And uh, I never used needles in my years in addiction. I always preferred to smoke. Um, I always uh, always managed to have housing, and, and except for that brief stint in my van that I mentioned. Uh, you know, I maintained employment throughout and tried to tried to present myself as, as reasonably as I could. So I didn't experience the stigma, but I the stigma affected me in a way that kept me hidden because I, I was unwilling to open up about my struggle. I, I wanted I didn't want to be discredited in the eyes of society if people knew what my, my struggle was. Uh, so part of our education is in saying, hey, like it doesn't matter, you know, uh people need to be free to talk about substances. Like let's break the stigma around talk, talking about it. In, in Canada, people have become quite um, a lot more open about talking about cannabis because it's, it's legal up here. Uh, you can buy cannabis down the street and uh, there's less and less stigma around it. Um, no one has any struggle at work really telling their coworkers their weekend plans to drink beers with the buddies or have some wine or whatever. Um, they're feeling more comfortable in Canada at least to mention that they're going to get in the smoke up. People don't talk about their plans to use ecstasy or cocaine or that they, you know, are going to take some pills this weekend. They, that is, there is too much stigma around that still. And that's why one of the things that we're seeing in, in the province of British Columbia where our coroner has called it the hidden epidemic is the fact that uh, 75% plus fatal overdoses are in private residences. These are people in their own private homes. It's not about, you know, people just on the street using drugs. It's about our, our neighbors, our loved ones, our friends, our coworkers. And it affects people far and wide. And if we can get that messaging out, and start changing people's attitudes about subs like substances aren't going to go away. drugs aren't going to go away i don't care how hard the nope. dea works drugs aren't going yep. away there will always be a demand yeah. for it so so we really need to revamp our thinking in that regard and and start uh treating treating the people that do develop addictions differently and with, with respect and with compassion and recognizing that they're they're human beings who are struggling mm -hmm. for a reason a legitimate reason mm -hmm. they, they got some pain and so if we can recognize that and have a little more empathy as a culture and as a society, uh, and we can really help those people. Uh. Can you come down here and help us? <laughs> that sounds well, like something that I think where yeah. we live specifically could really benefit. Because like you said, the yeah. stigma is just, it's so hard to break through. Like I still live in fear um, of mm. the people that I know finding out about my, my history because I know that they would look at me completely different. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I had to break through that. I, I totally relate to what you're saying. When about 10 years ago, I got out of a, a treatment center and I decided because of shame and stigma that I would reinvent myself completely and I would reset all my friend groups and I would um, just completely, I would never talk about my addiction past ever again. And that I would just, um, this way no one would be able to judge that part of me. It completely backfired. Obviously, I experienced a relapse and all these people that didn't know anything about my past suddenly saw it on full display. And, uh, and through that learning experience, I realized that there is tremendous power in vulnerability. And yeah, you know what? There may be those that write you off or judge you uh, and that you feel the weight of that stigma as a result of, of opening yourself up, but you are being true to yourself. You're empowering yourself. You're acknowledging this is who I really am. This is where I've been. This is uh, my journey and your story is powerful. So if you embrace that vulnerability, well, screw those that judge you. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. I feel slightly more empowered. I do. No, yeah. Yeah. Is it about that time, Eric? It's about that time, David. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the best part of the friggin' show. Time to go to the Twitter. So, we okay. need music. No, no music. I know we do. No music. Don't, don't encourage him. <laughs> um, so, do you want a fun question or do you want a more serious question? What do you guys think? Let's say fun. Fun? Let's like, do fantastic. Yeah. I've been yeah. waiting for this question for a while. 
Um, okay. So, Elder Shiko? Elder Shiko. Um, sorry, person on Instagram. Um, I think that's your name, is is El, Elger Shiko. But... How do you spell it? Uh, E-L-G-E-R-S-H-I-C-O. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. fun question. Uh, and the way this works is Daniel, you will go first, and then David, then okay. Ali, then myself. Um, what would be on a mixtape that you made for yourself yeah. to get through tough times, bad days, or great days? So, really, any mixtape. Songs don't have to, to relate to recovery. Okay. No. Oh, that's easy for me. I love music. Uh, it would be a combination of Snow Patrol, Whoa. Elbow, The National, and maybe Peter Gray, Peter Gabriel. And I will be Ooh, I will be vulnerable yeah. here right now and tell you that uh, I really like Lady Gaga's new album. I haven't, I haven't <laughs> heard it. Yeah, I haven't awesome. heard it. I have not. Yeah, I've not heard it either. I like I like that I you threw out. in Snow Patrol and then went. All the way, like, and then you went to Peter Gabriel. Snow Patrol is a good, like, great, I know. great, like, you know, mid, like, aughts band. Um, yeah. I, I'm, All right. Yeah, I like um, they got some good feeling tunes. They yeah. do. Yeah. They do. Uh, um, all right. Uh, so it, it, they said in good times and bad times? Good times, tough times, bad times, whatever, man. Doesn't have to relate to recovery. Okay. You know? Okay. Just go with what you feel. Okay. All right. Um, uh, I'm, I'm more of, I'm, I probably have the, the heavier um, sound out of all of us, I'm sure. Um, so, so Slipknot would have to be in there. Like Slipknot right. really. Like duality it, Slipknot? Been, uh, uh, Do you put like your fingers and, uh, into and, your and, eyes? Yeah. I yeah. Like, Sometimes I do like that's that the only thing that'll that'll slowly stop the ache. You know. Mm. I mean, it, it's really empowering that 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 whole band really struggled with their own di- uh, addictions at various points in their career, and now a lot of them are clean. And it, and like I love reading their lyrics; they're very poignant, and and they they've always spoken to me. Um, but like, so that, that that's my heavy dark side. But like, as far as like really lift, uplifting music, I I love a local artist. His name is Bosley Brown. He's he's fantastic. Um, I love I love a lot of the old old greats. I love the Temptations, Stevie Wonder, yeah. um, nice, uh, Bill Withers. And like anything that's got a got a really good groove to it. It like. It's gonna it's gonna pet me up and and keep me in in like that right mindset. But yeah, sometimes in the dark times, I need to go to that that darker music and and realize that like, hey, I'm not alone. These people feel this too, and there's a beautiful way out through music. Yes. Mm-hmm. What about you, Allie? Um, I would have to say Queen. I love Queen. Yeah. I grew up on them. The Beatles, mm-hmm. for sure. Any yep. any um, any album, I will take it all. Um, Paramore, love Paramore. Um, Paramore, yeah. really? Yeah, Paramore was like by far one of the best concerts I have ever been to in my life. I can do it, you know, for sure. Okay. Um, uh, Beyonce, <laughs> just because, like, you know, like I'm all about empowering women, and um, yeah, yeah, like, Wait, like I like to sing along. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm trying to think who else would be on there. Um, yeah, I do like the great. Like, I love those temptations. Um, yeah. I even like jazz. So like Miles Davis. Yeah. Um, yep. I love John Mayer. I'm a big John Mayer fan. Um, yeah, like anything that just kind of has some soul. Um, and makes yeah. you feel. Anything, nice. right? Whether it's sad, happy, uh, lonely, whatever. Just all the feelings. I love a, I love a good cry song. I have I have that yeah. I have that mixtape too. When when David needs to cry, he'll he'll pop on some Lucy Spragan and go to town. Cue the waterworks. <laughs> don't don't say a word, Eric. Just start listing off your music. Well, give me give me here, you guys. Give me a good good times or bad. 
That's totally like. Oh. To- well, no, like no, like there's there, they have to have like, uh, you know, give me just just you know, is this a mixtape for good times or bad? Whoever says it first, I'll I'll go with that. Good, good, times. good, good times. Good times. Good times. Um, happy time music. <sighs> uh, Chance the rapper. Um, oh, nice. Definitely okay. on good times. Uh, probably Rainbow Kitten Surprise is on good times. Um, the Strokes third album. I don't know what that is. Um, first impressions of Earth would definitely be on there. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I have a lot of really bad time music, but um, probably Matt and Kim. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm sure you do. Okay. Matt and, Matt and Kim, Kim would be yeah. on there. Uh, I feel like Scissor Sisters would be on there for sure. If anyone remembers Scissor Sisters. Um, I do not. Vaguely. Vaguely. Lot, lot of cocaine. Yeah. Lot of cocaine. I can't think of their songs, but yeah, I know I definitely heard. I was like, wait a minute, is that right? Right. So we're that- talking about like good times, like going out, like having fun, like Daft Punk, LCD Sound System. Um, probably, oh, yeah. probably Devo. Nice. Um, Anything from the 90s. Pre- for me. Like yeah. Pre-Fuse the 90s. 73. Yeah. Third Eye Blind. I like that Third Eye Blind's, like, you know, main song is about meth. It always throws me. Oh, always. Yeah. But, yeah. That's a good sing-along song. It really is. And Even then, like, I I'm me. outside. I can't more and I'm like, Jesus, this song is about methamphetamine. And it was playing on, like, TRL. And, like, did no one know this was about meth? But. Yeah. And shout out to for that. Thank you. Sure. Atlantis Morissette, Jagged Little Bill. Yeah. And yeah. Just, for, just for the sake of my friend, uh, he is a, a huge rush fan. David, and, uh, that is are, you, are you talking about Rush? Recovery playlist. Are you talking about Rush? Yeah. I don't really understand Rush. I don't think I understand prog music. I can I'm, respect it, but like I just don't like get it. But that is literally I'm music. I'm with Eric. Recovery playlist. Like I think Kobe. I'm with Eric. I don't I, understand Rush. Like I know they make like these crazy fucking you know albums about They're great stuff but i think coed and cambria is like i'd rather listen to them than rush and people can get mad at me about that but okay on that note <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's how i feel all right well I, I think we're about out of time but we would like like to uh say thank you to our very amazing guest daniel for joining us Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much, all of you, for having me and for the good questions. It's really an encouraging time for myself. Like Absolutely. Therapy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Except for it was it was free and better. Well, it's free in Canada, yeah. but not free here. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not free here. That's that's a different podcast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All thanks right. for all you guys are doing. Thanks for for uh, for doing this and keep up the good work. Like keep getting the word out there. It's an encouragement to many many people. Thank you. We really appreciate thanks. that. You too. Mm-hmm. Here at Podcast oh, yeah. Recovery, we are aiming to expand the scope of support for recovering addicts. Accessibility and convenience of helpful services is paramount to combating addiction. We work to bring the message of recovery to every addict, wherever and whenever it is needed. We believe that a powerful voice of recovery should be obtainable, practical, and at the touch of a button. Every addict deserves to hear a message of hope. Podcast Recovery is here to provide it. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us on another fantastic episode. Uh, If you feel like helping us out with some new equipment and keeping Podcast Recovery going, go to our Venmo, our PayPal, our Patreon, and as always, go to our Twitter, our Facebook, our Instagram, our YouTube channel. For more information about Eric, Carly, Allie, and myself, go to podcastrecovery.com. Absolutely most importantly, stay safe and stay clean.